And this love began when I was in first or second grade. My parents gave me a Super Nintendo system. Woo! Got some gamers in the audience, all right? It's good to be amongst friends. Excellent. Actually, I wasn't planning on really asking this, but just by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with video games? Consider yourselves. Wow, quite a few of you. Excellent. Such a friendly group of people. Great. So my parents gave me a Super Nintendo when I was about in first grade, and I think from their perspective, it was all downhill from there. <laughs> but from my perspective, it was the beginning of a journey. And video games from then until now have remained a passion of mine. And when I was young, I eventually realized that ultimately my goal is to have a career in the video game industry. And so for the past couple of years, I've been exploring those options. And one of the inside jokes I found out uh, in the video game industry is that as much as you get to work around games, it becomes more and more difficult to actually play games, which is something I'm trying to fix. And some of my professors in school uh, have to shake their finger at me now and again. I'm up too late playing StarCraft and not sitting for a test. <clears throat> Sorry, Professor Reed, last semester. <laughs> but in my experience so far, you know, over the past number of years, video games have received quite a bit of flack for being about escapism. And the past three years, I've actually worked in the video game-centric charity field, which I'll dive into in a minute. And I've found that video games, in my opinion, are actually creating pathways for activism. And I want to touch on that a little bit um, in this presentation, sort of discuss some of the work that a lot of the video game industry charities are undertaking, and the video game community at large is really being mobilized to uh, get involved with. And hopefully wrap that back around to uh, let some of the gamers here in the room know how they can become involved. When I was in high school, some friends and I uh, wanted to host a video game tournament. And Halo 2 was very popular at that time. Everyone at the lunch table would always talk about how great they were at Xbox Live. And you'd be sitting across from this kid who was basically saying that he was the greatest Xbox Live slayer uh, ever known a man. And you would say back to him, listen, man, I, I know you're just talking about his back right now. So it became obvious to me that there was this opportunity to actually host a video game tournament to give my friends a uh, chance to sort of put their money where their mouth was. And I brought the idea up to my high school counselor. And one of the things she said to me, which has still stuck, stuck with me today, was, you know, Zach, as a high school, we're always looking for activities to sort of bring the student body together. We know that not everyone is going to play sports. We know that not everyone is going to even go to prom. But video games are an activity that address and involve so many people across the social spectrum that it really makes sense for us as a school to sort of get behind this. So feeling inspired and encouraged, my friends and I sat out. And for the next few months, we started finding uh, Xboxes that we could borrow and televisions. We started promoting our event. I got kicked out of a couple high school parking lots for putting flyers in people's windshields. I asked I was that guy, I'm sorry. And uh, you know, over time, actually, when the, the event ended up coming about, we had about 300 kids in the local area sign up for this tournament we had planned. Um, a couple days before the tournament was supposed to happen, there was a police officer who belonged to this media censorship organization called the Parents Television Council. And in a nutshell, it's his role to go around and uh, educate parents on the violence in media, which I have quite a bit of respect for in, in many regards. Um, but he called up our superintendent and told her that the event that my friends and I were planning was a hazard to public safety, and that kids were training themselves to kill by playing violent video games, and that um, the, the, the event that we were hosting was not an appropriate environment for a high school. So we have 300 kids signed up for this tournament. It's a couple days before the event. Our superintendent hears this message, and she shuts down the tournament and cancels the permit that had my friends and I. Um, Needless to say, especially at that age, any high schooler will look for the opportunity to sort of stick it to the man. So uh, a number of kids got very upset. My local newspaper actually covered the story. They said, Zach, you know, this is, this is really interesting. We'd like to talk about this. And uh, they kind of ran the story as local teens try to do something productive, get shut down by the man situation. And someone uploaded it to this website called dig.com. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it at all. But basically, people submit news stories. You can rate them. It's kind of like Reddit, which is very similar. Uh, and the story kind of went viral. We had about 1,700 digs. And at the time, I wasn't really familiar with what dig was. But I started getting a lot of random messages on Facebook and MySpace at that time. And people would hit me up, Zach, I, I heard about your Halo tournament, man. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, we host Halo tournaments in my high school youth group all the time. Like, what's going on out there? So uh, it actually even attracted the attention of this guy named Marty O'Donnell, who works for Bungie Studios, the creators of Halo. And if you're not familiar with Marty, he's the guy who actually composed the music you hear. So when there's that epic sort of ha, 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 ha thing <laughs> that plays in the intro of the game, that's Marty. And he wrote this letter to the school, which sort of actually echoed the thoughts of my counselor, who you know, on her own isn't 
wasn't really familiar with uh, video games. But in the third paragraph here, he says, this was an excellent opportunity for the local law officials to connect with the teen community. So a year later, my friends and I, and I'm going to come back to Marty's point in a second, but a year later, um, my friends and I basically decided that we wanted to host this video game tournament. Um, we were still motivated to host a Halo tournament, and uh, there are a lot of sometimes negative stereotypes that, for different reasons, have been attributed to video games and those who play them. And in my case, at this point in time, I really wanted to make an effort to sort of prove those, those stereotypes wrong, which, in hindsight, I realized later that I, I think my initial intention to become sort of involved with charity um, was sort of out of spite, <laughs> uh, where, you know, we just sort of wanted to throw this new tournament and say, hey, shut us down now, what are you going to do? Um, but the interesting thing about charity that I've come to believe after running this organization is that unless you have a personal connection to a cause or you're able to make that initial leap of faith to get involved in the first place, it's often difficult to create that established relationship between having an actual concern and, and willingness to want to be involved with a, with a charitable cause. And so for me, that connecting bridge was video games. And a year later, we hosted this event called Gamers for Giving. It was a great success. We had about 500 people come out. It actually took place in the student center. And at the end of the day, we were actually able to raise about $4,000 for a local chapter of the Autism Society of America. And coincidentally, after we raised this money, um, some, the, the group of people used it to host an education event where local law enforcement officials talked about how to deal with kids with autism in emergency situations. And the person who shut down our tournament uh, was actually present and later quoted in the article as saying that the uh, conference he was able to attend thanks to our Halo tournament was very beneficial for him and all employees. So it was a nice sort of circle around that time. But you know, when I became involved with this, this charity stuff, I began thinking quite a bit about the idea of video games being used for charity. What does that mean? Is this even possible? Are we, you know, as an organization, I had actually launched a 501c3 called Gamers Outreach. And fast forwarding a little bit, we basically work to use interactive entertainment ways to improve the lives of others. So ultimately our goal uh, is to sort of facilitate these initiatives and empower and mobilize the video game community to combine their passion for gaming with charitable action. But backtracking once again, before I really came up with those ideas, you know, I really thought to myself, like, how, how are video games being used for terrible purposes? Is this possible? And there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Jane McGonigal, actually, is a woman who spoke at the larger TED conference, is doing a lot of work in this field, and talks about the ideas of people playing more games and getting some type of benefit from them. And my line of thinking led to the following sort of theory, and it's still a bit of a vague theory, but it's what I've been working with, that video games can be used directly and indirectly for terrible purposes. Directly meaning that in certain cases, there are instances where some type of benefit is actually derived from playing the video game itself. And whether that's educational or the game is being used uh, as a source of relief within the hospital environment, um, games have this potential. And indirectly meaning that there are certain instances where video games are used as this connecting platform to get people together for a particular charitable cause, such as the case of fundraisers. So the idea of putting video games in a hospital environment uh, really appealed to me. And I came up with this initiative called Project Go Kart, which is uh, actually just an acronym for Gamers Outreach Kart. That was clever at the time. Um, the initial drawings were actually just very sort of primitive. It was a cabinet on wheels. And uh, we ended up later teaming up with a medical company to take a cart that they already produced for the medical environment and putting an Xbox on it. This is actually a few photos from Mott Children's Hospital. And we uh, just recently donated a cart to a veteran's hospital in Dallas, Texas. And just some numbers real quick. Um, we have two over in Mott. And we estimate that uh, on a yearly basis, about 2,100 children are able to use our cart. Um, play video games while they're stuck in bed. In addition to this go-kart project, we actually also send video games to troops overseas. So there are a lot of guys in Afghanistan and Iraq right now that um, don't have access to some of the things we do here back home. So uh, they like to play video games just like anybody else, and we'll send them games and hook them up and give them something to do while they're overseas. Um, since our founding, we actually have received over $130,000 worth of video game donations, and those are in circulation right now um, being deployed with the troops. This is actually our, our kind of private GameStop, <laughs> and we have our own little uh, collection of games and donations we've received from different companies and individuals. But sort of widening the scope a little bit here past Gamers Outreach, a number of people in the video game community have actually been coming, been coming involved with uh, charity activities on their own. And this is seen sort of in the proliferation of what is called streamathons, where people are actually putting together these streams and raising money for charity in the same way that a charity organization might do a golf tournament or a walkathon. 
Um, just to name a few organizations, actually, there's a group called Child's Play uh, that sends video games to, or actually fulfills wish lists through Amazon for different children's hospitals. And another group called Extra Life, which uh, has raised money for the Children's Miracle Network. Child's Play last year received $3.5 million of donations. Um, and we're able to supply uh, things to children's hospitals worldwide. Extra Life is another group. They raised over a million dollars um, last year for this Children's Miracle Network. And there's other groups, actually similar to Gamers Outreach, that are also using video games for charitable purposes, such as the Able Gamers Foundation, which provides opportunities for people who suffer from disabilities to actually have access to things through video games. So in closing, I actually just sort of want to wrap this up real quick, but video games have, becoming, have become uh, much more mainstream than they were a few years ago. This picture here on the left is, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it very well, but it's actually an event called Barcraft, where uh, popular StarCraft tournaments have been broadcast in bars across the country, and people come together just like they would to watch football or basketball, and they're watching StarCraft. And just actually the other week, I was uh, at a bar with a friend, and we, we started talking about StarCraft, and I was just like, this is so odd. We would never be having this conversation. It's incredible. And this is just another photo from ESPN when uh, Halo Reach came out a year or two ago. Uh, there was a Ravens versus Jets game that was going on that same night, and they asked, which is more anticipated right now, the Ravens Jets game or the Halo Reach title? So the point I want to make to the video game enthusiasts, it's really easy to understand the passion that we all share for video games. And video games sort of have this, I'm not sure if the word intrinsic is totally correct, but in my opinion, they have this ability to connect to a passion inside. The stories, whether, whether it is the stories or competitive play, they speak to us in a certain way. And I believe that as video gamers, we're actually able to take this passion and use it in such a way that we can rally together around particular causes and really do some good with it. And we're only just now scratching the surface, but I would encourage you to begin thinking about video games in that way. And if you're someone who isn't a video game enthusiast and you're still thinking that we're just nerdy kids in our basement, which is admittedly somewhat true, um, <laughs> I would encourage you to think of video games with a new perspective. Um, these are things that are a true connecting platform. And we've talked about that quite a bit here throughout the day, about the idea of reaching out to people and everyone kind of getting together around particular causes. And I would encourage you to, to perceive video games in this way because I, I don't think that, I should say, I think that if, 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 you, if, if we sort of miss this opportunity, um, you know, we'll really be missing out on a, a chance to really connect with a lot of people, um, not just young people, but people of all ages who enjoy playing video games, new sort of technology that's emerging. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.